Well, good morning. I hope all of you are doing well, staying safe. Um, what I want to do today is uh, devote my entire top uh, entire talk to one subject, and that subject is uh, what has been dominating the United States and much of the world right now, uh, and that is uh, the situation regarding uh, the horrific killing of George Floyd. I know all of you are aware of this story, uh, but here is a, a timeline of the events uh, up until right now. Um, so on May 25th, uh, George Floyd was handcuffed by police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was attempting to pass a, uh, a $20 counterfeit bill. They arrested him. Um, and while laying face down in the street and in handcuffs, Derek Chauvin, a white American uh, Minneapolis police officer, he kept his, his knee on the, the side of Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, there is a videotape of all this, and uh, in it you can clearly see George Floyd uh, saying that he can't, he can't breathe. Chauvin kept his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck for two minutes and 53 seconds uh, after he became unresponsive. On the screen right now is the place where Mr. Floyd was killed, and it has become something uh, like a, a sacred ground. No violence, just peace and remembering and trying to understand the situation. The killing has marked widespread protests uh, around the world, and on the screen you can see a screenshot that I took from uh, 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time last night, and these are s the major cities under curfew in the United States. Pretty remarkable, uh, pretty remarkable graphic. Uh, even after what we've all what we've all been through in terms of the lockdown with the pandemic. Uh, it's hard to think that something could shock us after going through that, but this graphic on the screen right now, it, uh, it shocks me. So what does all this mean and where do we go from here? Well, uh, I am a historian, so I've been trained to analyze the past. Um, and I'm reluctant to project what I think the future holds for us. So my answer to the question of what does all this mean, uh, it's going to be shaped by the books of the past that I've studied. Uh, and I think that hopefully by combining some of these books together uh, will help us put the at least the present situation into better context. So let's start with the American Revolution because this is where it all begins. And here at here are two books on the screen right now. Uh, the first book is by uh, eminent historian Gary Nash, entitled The Forgotten Fifth. And the second book is Simon Shama's uh, book called The Rough Crossing. So Nash asks this central question. He says, when we look back on the founding of the United States, how do we make sense of the desire for freedom on one hand and then slavery on the other? And really, the, the paradoxes of the American Revolution are uh, simply stunning. Historians agree that the darkest shadow of the American founding was unquestionably slavery and the, the failure to develop – at least a very gradual plan to end slavery um, and uh, have emancipation was a huge mistake. Uh, so in Shama's book, uh, Rough Crossings, uh, he starts with a quote by Samuel Johnson. And Johnson lived in the 18th century. Uh, he was an English poet, playwright, and moralist. So he was looking at the the revolutionary moment in the United States from the perspective of the British. And he asked this question about America in 1775. He said, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes? End quote. Well, back to the Nash book, The Forgotten Fifth. Uh, 
who are who are the forgotten fifth that he's talking about? Well, these were the African Americans because they represented one fifth of the entire American population at that time. And of course, it was legal to keep them in slavery. Nash asks this compelling question then. Could slavery have been abolished? And his response was that it most certainly could have been abolished during the revolutionary era. And in fact, if it had been, um, it would have unified the nation instead of splitting it apart. Nash suggests that there was a widespread abolitionist desire among the American people, but the failure to achieve uh, emancipation or making slavery illegal uh, it falls upon the lack of political courage by the founding fathers of the United States. So this failure, it uh, set in motion uh, a nation uh, which has really never recovered from the stain of slavery. So let's move into the 19th century now uh, where we see that slavery remains an unquestionably central issue. So I think one of the most shocking titles of a presidential biography that I've ever read uh, is this one on the screen right now. It's a, a book on James Polk. Now, James Polk was the 11th president of the United States. Uh, he served between uh, 1845 and 1849. So this is about 12 years before the Civil, Civil War. Uh, historian William Dunsbear called his biography of Polk, Slave Master President, the double career of James Polk. And in it, he examines the period when slavery began to increasingly dominate American politics. Uh, and Polk himself was the owner of cotton plantations uh, in Tennessee and Mississippi. And uh, on this plantations, on these plantations, he owned, he owned 50 slaves. So the book is interesting because it's not only a biography of an American president, but instead uh, the, the author tries to really recreate the world of Polk's plantations and weaves into it the personal histories of his slaves. Um, it was a brutal life for the slaves with one out of every two slave children dying before the age of 15. So clearly this book sounds like it's going to paint a very damning portrait of Polk, but he does subtitle it uh, uh, The Double Career. And his double life, given what I said above, uh, is surprising because the author claims that Polk was in many ways – and I'm putting this in quotation marks – he was an enlightened owner. And this sounds like a horrible contradiction in terms. How can one be an, an owner of slaves and also enlightened at the same time? Um, but the author, uh, uh, Dozen Bears, uh, says he, he comes to this conclusion because Polk had an incentive plan for his slaves. He gave special privileges to a slave that he was closest with. But even still, even the most enlightened of owners um, – Polk continued to purchase slaves throughout his life, and as a result, Dozen Bear's argument is that be, because of Polk's financial ties to the plantation system, uh, this might have actually helped precipitate the civil war that Polk tried to avoid. So this is complicated. I mean as you can see, <clears throat> it's a very complicated situation. Slavery was embedded in monstrous ways into the United States society, uh, politics, and economy. So let's turn to our next book. Uh, our next book is Half Slave and Half Free, The Roots of the Civil War by Bruce Levine. So the central point that Levine is making in this uh, book is that slavery was essential to understanding the time period um, uh, prior to and the Civil War. The Civil War, quite basically, was fought because of an antagonism between the North and the South. And Levine said that at the – quote, at the bottom of that antagonism lay the institution of slavery. And eventually, the slavery issue reshaped and redefined the terms of political life in the United States, end quote. 
So the bottom line is that slavery was the cause of the Civil War, and this idea is supported by all professional historians today. There are there were other issues that then spun off of that, states' rights and things like that. But it really is slavery that is the central issue and the central cause of the Civil War. Let's let's emphasize this point a little bit more because it's important, and I think a lot of a lot of people, a lot of my students, uh, still don't believe that slavery was the cause of the Civil War. But uh, let's turn to this uh, critically acclaimed book by Chandra Manning called What This Cruel War Was Over. She starts with a great quote from the member of the 13th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment in 1862. So this is in 1862. Uh, qu the quote is this. The fact that slavery is the sole undeniable cause of this infamous rebellion that is a war of by and for slavery is as plain as the noonday sun. So here is someone fighting in the Civil War saying that the cause of this was slavery. She then uh, goes to compare this to a white southerner uh, from uh, Morgan's Confederate Brigade. And this is also a quote from 1862. And now this quote is from a, um, a southern soldier. Quote, any man who pretends to believe that this is not a war for the emancipation of blacks is either a fool or a liar, end quote. Uh, so the rest of the book then – I know I'm just taking two quotes out of this incredibly well-researched and written book, but uh, the book proves without a shadow of a doubt by looking at the soldiers of this, this time that slavery was the cause of the Civil War. Now, we all know that – the North won the Civil War, and the slaves were emancipated. So I think many of us think the story ends there. Slavery is done. Slavery is over. Uh, it's time to move on with a free, equal, and just society. But, but this is not the case. In the late 19th century, the plight of African Americans continued, uh, and they suffered greatly in numerous ways. So our next book is called – American Nightmare, The History of Jim Crow by Gerald Packard. Now take a look at the image uh, on the cover. It's one of the images most identified uh, all the way up until the mid-20th century, and that is separate drinking fountains uh, for white and black people. Now, the reason that there were separate facilities for uh, white and black people throughout the first well, throughout the period after the Civil War and uh, up until roughly 1950, the reason for this were the Jim Crow laws that were established after the Civil War. So for roughly 100 years after the Civil War, a quarter – that's one out of every four Americans – lived under a system of legal, legalized segregation known as Jim Crow. The purpose of Jim Crow was to keep African Americans subjugated at a level as close as possible to their former slave status. Now, Packard says that uh, the period from 1865 – that's the end of the Civil War – to 1896, uh, this was when slavery was outlawed, but it, it was transformed into something called peonage. Now, peonage is an, is an obscure term, but it means this. It means keeping men and women in involuntary labor bondage. So the goal of Jim Crow was to maintain a second-class social and economic status for African Americans while upholding a first-class social and economic status for white people. Jim Crow discrimination occurred in every state in, in America, uh, though it was far more prevalent in the South. So this takes us to the mid-20th century uh, and the civil rights movement. There are thousands of books that have been written about this. You know, entire college courses are taught on the civil rights movement. So it's uh, hard to distill its significance down to just a couple of minutes here. 
uh, and f for everything that I've been talking about today, it's uh, this is the broadest possible sweep of this story, and there's so much more to discuss about every one of these periods. But if I'm going to do two minutes on the civil rights movement, uh, we got to start and end with the, the man on the screen right here. The most important figure was unquestionably Martin Luther King Jr., and I highly recommend these three books by Taylor Branch. Parting the Waters, and this looks at America in the King years, uh, 1954 to 63. Second book is Pillar of Fire uh, uh, from the period 63 to 65. And then finally, At Canaan's Edge, uh, America in the King years from 65 to 68. So one reviewer of these books, uh, I, I love this quote about Martin Luther King. He said, we have had nothing like him, King, uh, in this country in living memory. Uh, King was a commanding moral voice. He was attached to no political party or public office. Uh, he moved governments and he changed social institution. Uh, this was Martin Luther King Jr. And here are just a few of his highlights uh, of, of his career. He uh, pro <clears throat> provided leadership in the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. Uh, he led a march on Washington, D.C. and delivered his famous uh, speech called I Have a Dream. That was in 63. He was instrumental in establishing the SCLC. That's the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957. Uh, this was a civil rights organization that supported the philosophy of nonviolence. For his work, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. Uh, and he was an advocate for nonviolent protests in the Memphis uh, sanitation worker strike in 68. And he helped meant, end many of the Jim Crow laws that, uh, that I just talked about. Most tragically, of course, his legacy was cut short in violence, and he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, uh, by a gunshot wound to the right side of his jaw and neck in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and this is where he was leading a strike of the sanitation workers. The news brought shock. It brought anger uh, and horror to all African-American communities, and the result uh, were deadly riots. So I was born in uh, 1966. That was two years before King was assassinated, uh, so I have no personal memory of that time period. Uh, the the first time, though, that I became deeply aware of the history of African-Americans was in 1976 when I was 10 years old in the miniseries called Roots, the Saga of an American Family by Alex Haley. Um, now, I knew about as much as a 10-year-old can about slavery and the Civil War, but this uh, miniseries was really the first opportunity that I had to – have true historical empathy for the struggles of the past. I still remember LeVar Burton or Geordie LaForge in Star Trek, as some of you might know, uh, shouting that he was his African name, Kunta Kinte, and not his slave name of Toby. So, of course, this miniseries was based on this the book by, by Alex Haley. Um, and here is what one reviewer said, quote, Roots is uh, one of the most important books and television series ever to appear. Uh, Roots galvanized the nation. It created an extraordinary political, racial, social, and cultural dialogue that hasn't been seen since the founding or since the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Roots fostered a remarkable dialogue about not just the past, but then the present day 1970s and how America had fared since the days portrayed in Roots. And to me, end quote, by the way, uh, to me, this is a great way to put it. Uh, it. Roots fostered a dialogue, and it still does today. Uh, that's that's the amazing and, and wonderful thing about it. It's an example of that. Here's a picture of my twins uh, in 2015. We visited Annapolis, Maryland, and uh, at – at the at the uh, oceanfront there is where uh, the Kunta Kinte Alex Haley Memorial resides. 
And these are my girls learning about the history because it was actually on this spot where slave ships docked and offloaded their – I'm using this in quotes – cargo, the, the human slaves, um, and they were, they were sold to other uh, plantation owners and slave masters. So this was a dialogue that I was able to foster with my daughters about this uh, horrific part of the American past. So looking at the 1970s and 1980s, um, and if you're interested in this, this is a fantastic book, uh, The Columbia Documentary History of Race and Ethnicity in America. But looking at the 70s and the 1980s, uh, black progress really slowed at best, and some have argued that it actually moved backwards. Uh, one example is economics. Uh, the white median family income rose 9% between 1970 and 1990, while the median black family income rose just 2%. So this rise was basic, basically uh, due to middle class African Americans, which it did see that 2% growth. But impoverished African Americans uh, in America's inner cities, uh, they did not dec decline. Uh, at all. Uh, the numbers at least did not decline and their economic situations did not increase. They were the most at risk because of the loss of blue collar jobs throughout the United States at the time. Uh, and the cities were also in very bad shape in, in terms of drugs, violence, gang warfare, and a lack of educational opportunity. Ronald Reagan as a president dominated the 1980s and his economic policies uh, hurt those in the lower half of the economic spectrum in the United States while helping those in the, the upper half of the economic spectrum. This then, of course, significantly hurt the African-American community and pre pre prevented many of them from uh, escaping poor cities where there was uh, very little investment in infrastructure or the educational system. So now we're getting more to the present, uh, the 1990s and early 2000s, and so many wonderful studies have come out discussing the African-American realities in society today. Here's just three books that I've selected on the screen right now, American Apartheid, Segregation, and the Making of the Underclass. So. Again, this is the uh, the actual attempt to, as we go back to the term peonage, to create and maintain an underclass in American society. Uh, the one on the right is called the truly disadvantaged, uh, the inner city, the underclass, and public policy. So again, we see this uh, term underclass. You know, we hear middle class, upper class, lower class. This is the underclass that was. Uh, as uh, Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton argued, was actually physically made after uh, the time of slavery. And so finally we get to this book in the middle of the screen here, and I think that um, the title is so compelling uh, because it's exactly, exactly what we're experiencing now, the bubbling cauldron. And what happens when you think of this you know, giant bubbling cauldron of water on hot fire. Well, it stays contained for a while, but once the fire becomes too hot, the cauldron um, uh, bursts open and uh, the flames come through and the water spills out. Uh, and that is exactly what's happening now. And in this book, The Bubbling Cauldron, Race, Ethnicity, and the Urban Crisis, uh, these authors describe why African Americans in America were a bubbling cauldron. So this takes us really through the broad history of African Americans and their experience from the founding of the nation to the 21st century. What we have to do now is lay onto this uh, the story of the ongoing history of police brutality. So again, this is a huge story, and uh, I'm just going to take it back as far as 1914. Uh, this is a newspaper article in the New York Age from, again, uh, June 4th, 1914, uh, almost to the day of right now, which is June 3rd. Let me read this 
Uh, this is from the newspaper. This is not a good condition of affairs for the police to develop and for the daily newspapers to encourage by condemnation and gross exaggeration. The decent colored people protest against the methods of the police and the daily newspapers, and they are not afraid to do it and cannot and will not be gagged into silence by not doing it. We say it for them as their spokesman, and we mean it. The police of New York make too free use of their guns in Negro districts, and they bolt into Negro homes and places without a warrant with too much freedom and blackguardism, and they should be compelled to stop it. Uh, other than a few antiquated terms in this, uh, this could be written June 3rd of 2020, uh, and one would not know the difference. By the way, this was a African-American newspaper, so it was able to uh, express what was really going on in the African-American society at that time. Let's jump a bit. Um, I, I will say that throughout this period from 1877 to 1950, uh, there was another form of brutality, uh, and that included public lynchings. Uh, over 4,000 African-Americans were killed without a trial uh, between 1877 and 1950 in very public hangings. And I, there's photos of these public hang, hangings, and I debated including some of them uh, in my slides today, but uh, it, we don't need to see it. It's just imagine a public hanging. You know what that would look like in your head, uh, and it's, it's horrific. So here is a here is a poster though from uh, from 1963. This is a poster carried in the 1963 March on Washington that I talked about earlier uh, uh, that Martin Luther King spearheaded and organized. What we often forget though uh, in the beautifully eloquent "I Have the Dream" speech uh, is that Martin Luther King also talked about police brutality, and he said this. I'm quoting. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality, end quote. So again, this is as the stain of slavery and Jim Crow and segregation has gone on since the, the dawn of the American Revolution, uh, so has this issue of police brutality. Uh, in 1991, we entered the age of violence uh, being captured on video uh, as Rodney King was brutally beaten by police officers. You can see uh, clips of the video on the screen right now. Uh, the, uh, Rodney King was beaten 50 times by the officers with a baton. Shockingly, and I still remember the shock at this, uh, the police officers were acquitted of their crimes, and the result was the Los Angeles riots that followed the acquittal. Lots more to say about that, but uh, but that brings us to today. This is a stunning graphic on the screen right now, uh, and this comes from a recent NPR article that included the following chart uh, of a list of some of the names of African Americans killed by police, killed by police since 2014. Uh, it begins with Eric Garner in the top left, and it ends on the bottom with George Floyd. Uh, the author of the article wrote this, uh, and I just have to read it. So in July 2014, a cell phone video captured some of Eric Garner's final words as New York City police officers sat on his head and pinned him to the ground on a sidewalk. I can't breathe, he said. On May 25th of this year, the same words were spoken by George Floyd, who pleaded for release as an officer knelt on his neck and pinned him to the ground on a Minneapolis street. We're at the point where the very words people use to plead for their lives can be repurposed as shorthand for completely separate tragedies. It, it's just it's just stunning. Uh, the same words were used by Eric Garner and George Floyd, um, and we haven't learned anything. I don't want to say 
we haven't learned anything from 2014 to the present. But really the point of my lecture today is what have we really learned from the American founding to the present? So where do we go from here? Um, I don't know. Uh, the only thing I can say is that I, I truly hope something positive will emerge from George Floyd's horrific killing uh, because nothing good has really emerged from the killing of all these other people on the screen right now. Uh, and we're, we're in the midst of chaos and uh, all I can say is uh, – you know, I want to say don't black out your social media. Uh, I understand the point of blacking out your social media and staying off it, but I think this is the time where we have to be as vocal as possible. Uh, stay vocal. Stay peaceful. Uh, talk about what's going on, and then use your vote to help make the United States a better place because I still have hope for our nation. Uh, but we can't just rely on hope to get us through this. Uh, we have to actually take action and actually make the United States united and not as disunited as we have been since our founding. That's my lecture for today. Uh, I hope this uh, I hope this brought some perspective on the situation that we're going through now, and uh, I thank you for taking the time to listen.